us, that person that we love most in the world, the one that can send us soaring joyfully into space, is also the person that can send us crashing back to earth. All it takes is a slight turning away of the head or a flip careless remark. And when we don't feel safe and connected, these moments are like a spark in a tinder forest. They can set fire to the whole relationship. This is an excerpt from Sue Johnson in her book, Created for Connection. James 3, 5 puts it like this. The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Today's session is about dealing with those small sparks that can come big fires in relationships and working out conflict, which is an inevitable as inevitable aspect of all of our relationships and cultivating the fruit of love and kindness as we dig deeper into soul health. There are three patterns that have been identified in relationships, three patterns of conflict, and these aren't just specific to couples, but they are evident in any shouting match that we might have had with a teenager or someone that is important to us. These three patterns can cause a breakdown in our relationships and they can be reframed as we recognize them, observe the behavior, name them. And by doing that, it can be the starting point of healing. The first one is quite easy to identify and slightly more difficult to change. It's the blame game, or as Sue Johnson calls it, finding the bad guy. It's really a game where everyone loses. It first surfaced in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and it is present today in many sophisticated forms in our relationships. It happens when we focus on each other as the problem in the relationship. If you look at relationships like a dance, a delicate movement of either stepping on toes or sensitively responding to the movement, this is what would keep our dance at what feels like a safe arm's length length. It prevents connection and closeness and intimacy. And when we get stuck in this pattern, we are consistently looking for what a person is doing wrong. And the, the, the confirmation bias raises its ugly head. The confirmation bias, simply put, is we see what we are looking for. We expect bad, we look for bad, we react quickly when we see that bad. And we focus on our toes as they get stepped on instead of the idea that we are all just learning to dance. Instead of grace for each movement, we find fault. We also often begin to make assumptions about the person in the stage. We read negatively between the lines and very often we are flooded with fear. Fear of being rejected, fear of being wrong and, and mostly fear of not being good enough. I think that here we, we also take on almost a false sense of power with our accusations. As long as we are accusing someone, we feel falsely powerful, but by doing that, we really are just shooting ourselves in the foot. What we need is love in this moment, and what we do instead is blame. Finding the bad guy is unfortunately just the warm-up dance to much bigger problems unless it's recognized. And one of the ways to interrupt it is to reframe motives of the other person and apply a slightly different perspective. Sometimes it's helpful here not just to accept the differences that are evident in people, but also to, to honestly value them and give them the benefit of the doubt. The next pattern is that we criticize the bad guy once we found him. There are two players here. One takes the role of the criticizer and the other one begins to withdraw. This is the most common dance of conflict and it can occur over an extended period of time. Johnson calls it the protest polka, if you like the dance analogy. This stage has a familiar loop. One person reaches out, usually in a negative way, with criticism, and then the other person is forced to step back in withdrawal, and the pattern repeats. Criticism, withdrawal, criticism, more withdrawal. Here, I believe the old Irish proverb holds true. It says that strife is better than loneliness, and many people engage in this conflict as it almost becomes better, that, that, that contact, than nothing at all. This pattern can be a subtle, very long-term dance and it gains momentum by missing signals, by passive-aggressive responses and constant tension. It generally spirals and the question that can stop the spiral is to just simply ask ourselves, 
What is my goal for this relationship? You see, if our goal is to find fault, we, we can always find it. Perception is not just powerful, but we are also flawed human beings who, who make many mistakes, some intentionally and, and others unintentionally. If our goal is for a good relationship, then as we choose to replace blaming and reminding people of their mistakes and, and our, our withdrawal, we can choose to move towards people with expressing kindness in moments of love. Once you get started, this feels far better than criticizing because love is what we wired for. Love is in our DNA. It's been breathed into us. It's a reflection of the image of God. And it's something that is right and it feels right. Have you heard the common advice that when in doubt, do or say nothing at all? This is terrible advice, Sue Johnson says. When the tongue should probably be restricted, it should never be restricted on encouragement, on connection and on love. If we want something different, we need to engage with kindness in our spoken word, a fruit of the spirit. Saying nothing or withholding love just starves the relationship and will starve the person on the other side. The third pattern, which I see quite frequently as it is usually the time that couples seek help as a last ditch attempt before the finality of the divorce. It's marked by complete disengagement. It's called the freeze and flee. It's the deadly silence of disconnection. And when we look, if we look at relationships like a dance, this is the dance where both partners have just chosen to sit out. They've given up. They feel the tension, pain is common, and all hope seems to be lost. They can no longer picture a good future for the relationships. And sometimes a, a practical politeness occurs. No one initiates and responds with messages of love, and they even stop criticizing. Instead, they just hold their ground. This takes more effort and energy to hold ground. As if we are wired to love and be loved, holding back that love is like a poison that takes deep root. It eventually turns into a bitterness that we are not created to live with. The beauty of relationship is that it is never past the powerful place of choosing kindness. It's never too late and even this third stage can be reframed and encouraging people just to take risks as by this time they really have nothing more to lose. This third pattern can finish off a relationship or it can be the point where we come to realize that we are at the end of ourselves and we enter that humbling experience sometimes of brokenness and we start to relinquish our will to God's will, which is to love well. This is the time where we begin to realize our own flaws and instead of focusing on the fault in someone else, we are brave enough to face our own. This is not the victim stage of I'm so bad that nobody can love me. Instead, it is a point where we actually embrace God's love, the love that gives us value. And out of that love, we begin to love others. We come out of holding our ground and hiding and allow ourselves to be loved as a flawed person. And we choose to love another flawed human being. This is the moment that we give up on assigning blame and criticizing and we begin to look for the good, look for the green. We forgive without reminding and we enter into the freeing place of letting go. This is not the time where we start again at the beginning of the cycle and start assigning blame. This is a time where we stay in our own lens. We recognize our own patterns, not the patterns in someone else. And we engage in this beautiful fruit of choosing kindness. I'll see you next time. Is your